it's hard to do exactly even if I can get the next day. So it's even harder to just do the next day. That's why I don't do it. You have to remember the mind. It's the counting it all this out all the time. So you can calculate three months out of three days. Because you can do this. Yes. So um so really it doesn't make sense. All right, so why don't we uh, regroup a little bit. So I wanted to discuss kind of three different things we've talked about a little bit before we go over the lab and the key. So here, I'm going to show you just like a couple of different things. So we talked about count, we talked about tally, we talked about summarize, things like that. And I just wanted to make the distinction between the two because I think in some respects it is a little, uh, not unintuitive, but a little confusing because the idea is you have this data set and you say count. And count, you have to put in a variable. So if I say bike, just count. It essentially just gives me the number of rows back, right? But if I say bike, count, and then I give it a variable, it counts, gives me a frequency distribution for that, that variable, right? Those frequency numbers, the counts for those. Now, we've talked about tally a bit. Right? And if I try this with tally, it says, like, I don't know what you're talking about. So count takes variables. Tally does not. So I think it's a little bit confusing because a lot of times you say group things by, group it by, group by. So if, you, if, if count doesn't make any sense to you, this might make more sense to you where you say bike, the data set, you group it by a variable, and then you tally that, that up. So tally works on groups. Right? So this will give you the same output where we grouped it by variables and then we did the counts of them. We did the, the frequencies. Right? So again, this doesn't work. And again, if I say bike tally. So again, bike, uh, sorry, count and tally without any arguments in there and no grouping will give you the exact same number. It's just pretty much the number of rows. But the big difference between it is if you want to, if you use count, you put the variables that you want to count up in there. If you want to use tally, it's you group the data and then you tally it up. Okay? So that might hopefully either makes it more confusing or less confusing. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Whatever makes more sense to you. They give you... Nope. So just whatever function you remember and the way to use it, right? If you're like, well, I know every time I want to summarize stuff or any time I want to get counts or anything, I always group the data. I always do group by. Use tab. That's it, right? So again, there's also uh, some other... So there's add count or add tally in the same way, in the same way we did 
sorry, let's, uh, I'm just going to select type, uh, is there a name? Project N. I'm just going to select a couple uh, rows of that. So, difference between tally and add tally is the same thing as whether we summarize or whether we mutate. Right? Here we're tallying them up. We're summarizing the data into like frequencies. Here we're adding the tallies. So we group the data by type, got the frequency of each type separately, and then we added that to the data set. So you see side path with an NA project, both have the number seven. For example, sign root in College Town all have the number 304 to show that like in this specific categorization, there's 304 observations. But again, this data set here has the same number of rows as the original data set. We just added a tally onto the end based on the grouping variables. All right. So again, uh, whatever makes more sense to you, this or this, these are just, again, shortcuts for summarize. All right. Make sense? All righty. So now, if else. All right, so what was the average bike lane length per year that they were installed? So set bike dollar sign date installed, so date installed from the bike data set to NA if it is equal to zero. So there are a lot of different ways to do this, but the way we've, we've presented so far is with if else. Okay, if else, again, takes a logical statement, and then you put in what do you want to replace it with if it's true, what do you want to replace it if it's false? Right, that's the order. So here, we take the data set, we're replacing it. So again, we're reassigning it, so we want this to stick. We're mutating the data set, we're saying date installed. We just want to replace this variable with an, the if else statement. If it's equal to zero, make it NA, otherwise keep it exactly as it is. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, so, sorry, who, who uses Stata in here? In here? Like, or is learning it stated? Okay. Otherwise, is it, is, is it like Excel or something like that? So I think I think this there is some analogies in Excel with this. In Stata, it's like a replace if, right? Um, that's that's very similar to kind of what it, it's saying. Like, replace it if this condition in some respects. But it's just a different syntax kind of all together. But that's the same mentality. Um, but the big difference between like Stata, right? You don't have to do a gen statement. You, like you could just, this could be like date installed five or D or whatever it is. You don't have to like generate it and then all that kind of stuff. All right, so now the date installed is set to zero. So what is the average bike lane length per year? So here I showed you, ex I'm showing you examples of not using dplyr, but again, um, here, we can, well, I gotta, I, let me ask you, which way would you do it? What's the first step? We want to calculate statistics over a variable. Group the data, right? So we're going to group it by date installed, okay? And then we want the average length. So again, we're going to use summarize. We're going to group the data by bike installed. And again, we can sum uh, because maybe we wanted the ends here, right? Nope. That, oh, I didn't run that. Sorry. That should stick. And then here, we're actually run summarization where the NA is equal to this. So here is the date installed and the average of the bike. All right, so it's 126 observations. Um, so summarize is super powerful. If you're gonna, if you're like all these different options are really confusing, pretty much don't worry about any of that. Just use summarize, okay? And the nice thing is, so when we start getting into again, like the is that na, you can say sum is that na length and not missing. We can do things like this. We calculate a variable. So this is just the number of observations. This is a this is the number of observations that don't have a missing value for length. Oops, that is missing. Sorry. That 
That is summing up. So it says, is it missing, yes or no, true or false. True counts as ones, false counts as zeros, and it just adds them up. In this data set, nothing is, so we're going to get zeros for all the, the lengths, because if we look at the data again, where's the length? There. Right, again, this is one way to explore the data. Now we're going to talk about a few things of summarization, like hist. Um, if I do a histogram of it, which again, uh, not very helpful, but it does see, I do see that some are very, very small. Um, if I said like min, bike, length, right, I could say, oh, that's actually zero. So maybe I want to say like, maybe before doing this, I want to mutate length equals if else length is equal to zero, set it to NA, otherwise keep the length as is. Then if I do this operation, we see that, oh, the one with the, the length of zero is actually, has no other information about uh, the date installed, right? So again, um, if we just do mean length now, we have to also ensure that we put NA.RM equals true, because again, there is a missing value in there, so if we just do mean on that, we see here that the mean is now set to NA because there's now a missing value. So unless, again, you put NA.RM, it's not going to calculate the statistic. So here it is 216, but it is over not 126 observations. It's now over 125. Okay, because this is the number of observations. This is the number of missing for this variable that we calculate. Is that clear? At least ish. I mean, I, I understand that we haven't gone over this. Is that an A thing? The idea is just a test. All right. Do some plots real quick. I don't know why I ever know it's coming up. All right. So basic plots. So basic function plot. We are going to talk about a whole framework of plotting and data visualization. We make really, really nice plots. Kind of the plots we showed you on like day one, right? The, the plots where it's like things that are different days of the week for different countries or, or sorry, big different um, uh, circulator uh, lines with different colors. Right? We're going to show you how to do that. Uh, but there are some good default ones that are in R. Now, we're going to teach you ggplot2, right? It's a way to make really nice graphics. Great. What are the point of plots? Point of plots are to be able to explore your data quickly and easily. Right? That's the point of exploratory plots. ggplot2, when you get the hang of it, is very good at that. There's a function called qplot, which we'll talk about today. But some of these are really short. Shorthand, they give you exactly like a good brief idea of what you want to do. And these are some of the good examples. So plot x and y, you put in two vectors. It does a scatter plot. Box plot y, this little tilde x. So this is what's, what we're going to talk about a lot more. It's called formula syntax. y is a function of x. Right, so it'll do box plots of the, the y variable with x on the x-axis. Hist, we'll just do a histogram. Density, we'll do a smooth histogram or a kernel density estimate. Just a smooth. Okay, so ggplot2 is a package that has really revolutionized the way a lot of the plots are done in R. So it stands for the grammar of graphics. So Hadley Wickham wrote the ggplot2 package based on a book uh, called the grammar of graphics. Right, so there's a function called qplot, which is quick plot for most of the basic examples. Right, for most of the basic things you want to do, a lot of the things you want to do for exploratory data analysis, there is the function qplot. We will talk about how to make more general plots after that. Doesn't matter for now. Qplot's the one you care about. So you see all these arguments for qplot. So there's the function x. There's the function, or sorry, argument. The argument x, the argument y. What do you want to put on the x-axis? What do you want to put on the y-axis? There's other stuff, right? Do you want to color, uh, you know, variables by? Like, do you want to color the points by a different variable? Do you want to fill in something by a different variable? Do you want, you know, the size of the point to be something based on a different variable? What is the data set you're using? Uh, facets. When we showed you yesterday, 
uh, or sorry, showed you on day one, like different panels for different variables, right? So a different pa a panel for Saturday, a different panel for Sunday, a different panel for Monday, right? That's what a facet is. All the rest of them, for the most part, we will talk about in more detail. Like, what are the limits of the x and y axes? Do you uh, want um, it to figure out what kind of plot you want to do? If you put in x, just x, not x and y, it'll assume you want to do this too. If you put x and y in there together, it assumes you want to do a scatter plot. You can change the behavior of that with this argument genome. Again, what do you want to put on labels? All this kind of stuff. But for the most part, qplot. We'll do a quick plot. So again, it's just, plotting is one of the most important tools of exploratory data analysis. Um, it's a way to see you know, large, large sets of different information that you wouldn't be able to discern in any way from just looking at a spreadsheet um, or the viewer or anything like that or summary statistics. Um, so one of the things that I think uh, older R users would, would really like is that, that um, ggplot2 makes nice graphics and that's a bad thing to old R users because they make them nice-ish, right? So I showed you that histogram, right? That histogram was ugly, right? You would not really, um, without, you know what, reasonably estimate that you're gonna show, you're gonna hand that into like a reviewer or your boss and say, look at this great plot, they'd be like, that, you need to make that better, right? So the nice thing about the old school style of R graphics is that they are quick and dirty but they have infinite customizability and they don't give you this false sense of idea that it's good enough, right? So you have to improve it. You have to make the labels better. You have to make the things bigger. That's not to say that they're, they don't have really good defaults and all that kind of stuff. They put a lot of time and work and thought into these. But the idea is you wouldn't just say, oh, that's good enough. Here's, here's the plot, right? You have to always, if you're doing things for publication or a report, you have to polish them, change them. We are not talking about those plots. We are talking about stuff you just need to glean some information about the data to do exploration. Yes? Um, could you quickly just describe the difference between a ggplot and a plot tree? Hmm. Yeah. So ggplot is a framework for, for plotting. Plotly is a different framework. It's based on a JavaScript library called Plotly.js. It's got um, a little bit different formatting and different ideas about it. Uh, it's gotten a lot more polished since we've kind of started teaching this class. Um, it's really, really great. One of the big things is uh, it's a really big on interactive graphics, right? So we are going to get to that because if you build a ggplot up, you build a plot up, you can very, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the time run one function and turn it into an interactive graphic with plot. So you can say, I know how to do ggplot. I can do all the things I do with ggplot. But I want to make it interactive. I want you to be able to zoom and change the points and click things and see interactive stuff. There is a function in Plotly that allows you to convert the two. The convert the two. It doesn't work for 100% of the plots, and it doesn't give you all the customizability without learning Plotly, but it gets you a far away there. So that's why we teach ggplot too. But yeah, since ggplot is for static plots. Mm -hmm. All right. So we got to load up the package, ggplot2. It is in the tidyverse, so if you load up tidyverse, it is there. So qplot, we are going to use the empty cars data set really quickly. Again, x-axis, we want the displacement, y, we want the miles per gallon. So again, we see the default, it does a little scatter plot. We can see that there's some sort of negative relationship between these two variables. Okay? So if you look on your on your screens or on the PDFs, and it's very very faint here, you should see again there is a uh, there's a, a shaded background with grid lines and things like that um, that are kind of useful. You also see differences um, between other plotting systems, like the y-axis is not tilted, so you don't have to turn your head to see the numbers. They are like this; uh, they are vertical. So uh, we're gonna do a histogram. So remember we had those before 2000 averages for the TB incidence data. Let's just say we put X here. So the big difference between this plot and the last plot is we just put the X variable in there, not X and Y. So we didn't put X, or so we didn't put Y in there. And if we had just let it go, it if we and not to find this thing geome, it would have done a histogram anyway. But we wanted to be explicit to say, hey, I want a histogram. Okay. So that's what this thing is. So it's that's what the geometry is. So if a lot of these words are kind of maybe foreign or different or strange, it's because they are derived from this book, The Grammar of Graphics, where this, I forget the author, 
you give me the author's name? No, grammar or graphics. So uh, he spent a lot of time and energy into like defining literally syntax for like grammar and like the idea of like how do you put layers on top of a plot and geometries are one of the terms that he used. Therefore, Hadley had adopted that for his package. So here we just put in <clears throat> the before the 2000 average. Again, we got to put in the data set. Nice thing about this with Qplot, like all the things with dplyr we've talked about, you do not have to put in dollar signs or reference it. You just tell it which data set and it understands. So here also we see that it removed one rows containing non-finite values. So we had one NA or infinite or not a number in there. And it said, you know what? I don't know how to deal with that. I can't plot that on here. And it plotted all the real data. Okay? But it gave you a warning. So here uh, we put X to be year and then Y to be the year average for the youth tobacco survey averages, and we say geom equals line. Like I said, if you put x and y in there, it gives you a scatter plot by default. Let's say you want a line plot, you gotta tell it, I want the geometry to be a line, okay? So we haven't done any fun things with like coloring and all that kind of stuff, we will get all that in more detail in the data visualization lecture. But again, this is the idea to see relationship between variables and uh, density or histograms of our data. So over the years and states for the uh, youth tobacco survey data, what is the density of smoking status incidents? That's what the data value is. We say, again, we put an X by default. It would assume we want to do a histogram. I don't want to do a histogram. I want to do a kernel density estimate, which again is like pretty much like a smooth histogram. So I say genome equals density. Okay? So this gives us the distribution of the data. I want to do box plots, a bunch of them, right? So again, we have that youth tobacco survey data right here. We tell it that's the data we're putting in there. Here, we want the location of the data, which was the states or the national average. So these are all the states of the United States. Yes, it looks garbled in here because you pretty much have a lot of overlapping um, variable or a lot of overlapping labels there. You can change that where you tilt the labels and they go down horizontal, you can tell, tell whatever angle you want to so you can be able to discern what type of state it is. You could also flip the coordinates, right? You can say, you would say, what X is the location description, Y is the data value, so it's do, doing box plots for each one of these, and we're making sure that's the case with Geo and box plot. Why is it not the uh, tilde? Ah, so that is for, so those tilde things, are, so that's going to become very, very important later when we start defining models, right? That's why they call it, it that's why it's formula syntax. So it's really, really, new, it's, it's, I don't want to say started, but the, a lot of the time it's used in when you're building a model. Like y is a function of x1 plus x2 plus x3, right? So in the standard default ways of plotting things in R, box plot, PS, those type, types of things, someone can take that syntax. Ggplot2, it does not, right? So we show you kind of those examples because sometimes after you kind of get a handle on Qplot, you might want to, uh, I, I still think this is great, but sometimes it's a little bit too much code to write to just get a box plot for me. Um, so for example, I use the box plot function. But if you're gonna kind of, we, we kind of give you a preview of those for later, but at the end of the day, when you're starting to do a score theory data analysis, Qplot is the way to start. Qplot gives you, gets you like pretty much there. Um, and again, this is the same exact plot, but we are flipping the coordinates. Okay, big difference. Also a little bit of history of why this is the way it is. So the pipe was introduced after ggplot2 was already created. So ggplot2 was created, and the idea is that you have a canvas and you add layers to that canvas, or you add things to that canvas. So literally, the operator to add things is the plus sign. So I want to get this plot, and I'm adding a coordinate flip. It is not the pipe. The pipe was, was kind of introduced later to R, so that's why ggplot2 does not use the pipe. Okay? That, but that, so that might be kind of a, a thorn in the side of some, some new users, but that is the way it is. 
There have been multiple, multiple discussions about trying to port GDPOT2 with the ability to use the pipe. It's not going to happen. Period. Okay. Can we just flip the X with data value and Y in the location? Ah, no. So let me see. Let me just pull that up. So again, if you go to here, let's go to the website real quick. Let me see. I'm just going to pull up the. So again, we've talked about this, but we should just be clear that the R markdown for this lecture should just be right there. So if you do want to bring it up, um, box lot. So I'm going to run everything up until here. So I'm just going to comment that out for now. TB is read TB. B. I'm going to comment that out because that didn't necessarily run. Uh, box plot. So I'm going to show you what the output would be of that. Do, 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 do. All right, great. All right. Zoom. All right, great. Jumbled letters. I don't think that gives you what you want. How oh, maybe it does? Ah, no. It does not. All right, that's what it gives you. So that is because... Um, the way the box plot function, the way qplot kind of assumes the order of the data can work, right? So if you do just try to flip the axes, um, so that's why we introduce core flip because sometimes the way it assumes x and y come in, x is like the um, kind of maybe categorical variable, y is the numeric value that you really want to plot, right? It does different things, whether the data is a numeric value or a, um, like a character, for example. So sometimes, so if you get something like this, where you're like, uh, that doesn't work, good strategy is try flipping the arguments and then flipping the coordinates. If you really want this on Y and X. So it is a small kind of, I mean, it is a confusing little aspect, but that's not to say like everything's going to work exactly the way you want. So the idea is, instead of flipping the x and y arguments, we actually keep the same arguments, and then we flip the coordinates. So that we can actually read the names of the states. OK? Yeah? Um, I have a question. Where can I find the slides for this on the process? So this should, be, this should still be in data summarization. It's okay. just after part uh, four. So we are on slide 39. So um, sometimes you have entire matrices that you want to do scatter plots of them, where you do or uh, pairs plot, where you plot pairwise scatter plots for matrices X and Y, where you get an entire like diagonal of X versus X, and then every one of them is like X versus another Y variable, for example. If you do pairs of the averages, this is the 1990 data versus the 1991. So for example, here is 1990 versus 1995, the scatter plot of those two things. Um, it, so pairs plots are really uh, helpful. They go up into kind of uh, certain limits of maybe after five by five, they're a little hard to see or discern. Um, the one thing I'll say, a lot of the functions, if you see something in R where you're like, hey, like, or you see something on Stack Overflow or whatever, it says, hey, this is how you do the plot that you want. And it's in base R. And you're like, yeah, that's great. Well, I only know GDPlot2. There's almost always someone who made a package or an add-on that does GG plot style things. So GG pairs R. So there's a GG pairs function in the GG. I don't know if it's the G galley or the, I think it's the GG ally. I think that's the way this function or this package is supposed to be where you give it a data set and it shows you how to do pairs plots. Let me see if I can, uh, let's see if I can just see what the, uh, 
I don't know if I have that function package loaded. There we go. It's also my, uh, yeah, so for example, this is a pairs plot from the GG pairs function and the GG ally, where instead of doing you know, the name of it, it says, okay, on the top, it's TARS1, TARS2, TARS3. It gives you the correlations and the uh, right upper triangular. It gives you the density plot of the data, and it gives you scatter plots on the other uh, angles. So like TARS1 versus TARS2, TARS1 versus TARS3, TARS2 versus TARS3. So. I don't use these that much, but people seem to love them. So. All right, so we're just going to briefly go over uh, part four, and then we're going to move on to the next lecture. Maybe we take around five or ten minutes. Let me just review kind of how much that is. So it should just be uh, one or two. Um, it's one or two. Uh, it's just one question. So numerically and graphically, describe the distribution of the bike lane length. Bike lane lengths. So the length variable. And again, we show you a bunch of options in the key of how to do that with um, Qplot and the standard stuff in R, where you sorry, where you plot it with the density or hist, but for the most part, try it with Qplot. So again, try with the x variable. And I think oh sorry, it is six and seven. So let's work on that for about 10 minutes, and then we'll regroup around 9.50. And then, like,
That's good. That's it. All right, so really briefly, one of the reasons why ggplot2 or qplot specifically, why qplot specifically doesn't work well, work nicely with the pipe, because so the pipe does what? It takes something and pipes it into a function, right? I did say, but I said it briefly, it pipes it into the first argument of that function, right? Nice thing about dplyr, every First argument is data set, right? What is the first argument of qplot? X, right? It's X, Y, and a bunch of dots, and then data. Also, the order, if you don't name an argument, so if I just say qplot length data equals bike, Totally fine, but the order matters. So if I say num lanes, and then I put num lanes and then x, or and then length, the order matters. So in the first instance, it says, hey, you didn't name these anything, so I'm gonna assume you're putting them in order, right? First thing, qplot takes an x, then it takes an y. So in the first instance, is that this is your x variable, this is your y variable. Here, x variable, y variable, right? Now, the order of the arguments do not matter if you name them. If you, if you set them to be whatever the argument name is. So for example, this gives you the exact same thing. Because it says, even though you put in bike as the very first argument, I don't care. I know that's the data. Because you told me that's what the data is. Right, so in arguments, sorry, in functions, the order matters, right? Um, but you can put them in any order you want, 
if you use the argument names from that function. Right, so x, y, data, whatever. Right, so I can say like bin width equals two. Right, if I'm plotting the bike length, right, it doesn't matter where I put bin width. Doesn't matter. But if I just put like two, it's going to go and it's going to say the data set is this, the x variable is this. What's the next one in order? Y. So it's going to assume y is two. Right? So order the arguments matter if you don't name them, but if you name them, doesn't matter at all. Now, why is this a problem with piping? Where does data come in? It's a later argument. It's not the first argument. So if you're like, I love love using the pipe, I that's the way I you know operate. You can do it, and in some instances, it might be helpful to know how you do it. X equal length, data equals dot. So weird, weird syntax, but the idea is if you are piping the byte data set into a function or any data set or piping something into another function and you want to say, oh, I don't want to put it there, I need to put it somewhere else, you just use a period. That's all. So you say qplot x variable the data set and you say put the data there, put bike into that argument. Can't you just write q plot x, y, and then data and say whatever five arguments is there? So what do you mean? So what do you mean? Where can you say data equals and put whatever Ah, can you say data equals and then pipe it in? No. Doesn't work. No, that doesn't work like that. Yeah. Good question though. Um it should you close the new data set and put the new data set in. So how how do you so you're saying like Bake two is equal to, so I'm trying to understand the way you're conceptualizing this. Like make a new data set, mm -hmm. use it, like, and then when you run q plot x equals length data, then you know bike two. Like that doesn't work like that. Sorry, uh, Andrew, are you getting? Did you understand that? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It's so it's, I'm uh, just I'm trying to understand. Um, Kind of the way that would go. So you can't like I thought what you were under, you were saying is like data equals bike and then pipe that in something like that to Q plot. No. So pretty much pipes the pipe is a great operator, but it really relies on the fact that the thing is the first argument in the data. If that it, or sorry, the thing you're trying to pipe in is the first argument of that function. If it's not you have to use this we kind of strange syntax with the period. That's all I'm saying. So um, again, qplot, uh, pretty useful for that. And so again, if you you see something like a stat underscore bin using bins equals 30, pick better value with bin width. I already showed you, but again, you can say bin width equals five or something like that. And then it'll do that. So there is one upside. So the reason I do show you this not to confuse you, is because there is, again, one upside to using the pipe in this instance, right? So you're saying like, oh, I want to do num lanes here. If I say n, here it will try to, again, do some completion. It says like, oh, this is a column of your data set. Great, right? That only happens when, I don't need bin with there because that's not part of a scatter plot, right? But if I do qplot, x equals, just if I hit tab, it just says x, I don't even know why it says that, but like y equals, so it doesn't, doesn't really, the tab completion doesn't really work well in that instance with the, even if I say data equals bike, it's not like, oh, now it knows the columns I need to work with, right, so the pipe still does afford you that, that nicety, um, especially, you know, like me, I misspell length. All the time, so yes. So is Q plot a plot <coughs> Q plots a function in ggplot two. Okay. No, it's not.
Oh, last one. So again, here are some other ways you can do this, right? So quantile, again, we could use summarize. Uh, well, we can't use summarize because again, quantile doesn't really like multiple things. We could have done the individual quantiles themselves, with like different probabilities. But if you just run probability, or sorry, if you just run quantile on the bike length, we see the quantiles of that data. Hist is again one way in R, which again, you should see by default, it looks pretty pretty rough. Something you wouldn't necessarily send to someone. Um, we can change the breaks on that. Uh, here we're doing the Q plot, which most of you uh, got out of the gate. Here we could also transform the data. Here, sorry. Here we are doing Q plot, and in the function we are log 10 transforming the data so that we are transforming it to see kind of more. Uh, the data is kind of skewed. So here is log 10. So two means you know 100. Three means 1,000. Um, with respect to the bike lane length. And you see we get a warning because one of them had a zero in here. Taking the log of zero, you get negative infinity. So if we describe the same above after stratifying by type and then number of lanes. So again, if we say y is length, x is type, we see we get these box plots. Right? Again, if we had changed these around, if I say instead that I want x to be length and I want y to be that. We get these weird lines because again, uh, ggplot or qplot assumes that if you are going to do a box plot, that the y variable is the thing that you are looking at. Uh, is that you're actually just uh, looking at the distribution? So again, you could have done this if you say like, you know what? Where'd that go? Okay, it just didn't go anywhere. Say like, you know what, I can't read any of those. Again, you can run coord flip by literally adding it to the plot cord flip. And now you have the bike types on the y-axis versus the x-axis so that they're actually readable. Similarly, we can do the same thing with number of lanes. And <clears throat> again, uh, to, uh, so quantile is a, a, an interesting one. If you were to do it, I think not to compute, there are ways that you can do it where you actually get a summary back that's not just one number, and you make that into a data set. Right? I told you that summarize means one number. Right? Summarize means one number. There are ways to get around that, but they are confusing to start with. So if you were to say, I want, I want the quantile, though. Uh, my suggestion right now would be to do to do five copy and pastes where you want min, Q25, Q50, Q75, max, where you just put the problem argument into quantile yourself. Um, that's probably the best way I could describe it. If you were to do the, um, if you wanted the distribution by each, for example, bike lane type, here's the 70th percentile. But I would do Q, Q25, Q50, Q75. All right? Yeah. I don't know if you showed this yet, but the four book of what the uh, box plot would look like for the second one. Mm -hmm. And the non lanes. I got a question now. Okay, so it is supposed to look like that. Yeah. So. And I gave you the same as that. So, Qplot tries to be smart, or ggplot tries to be smart and says, like, hey, it's numeric. Like, <clears throat> you, you don't want to, like, you don't want to separate these out. So we're going to talk today, a way to get around that. You could make it a character, or you could explicitly say this is a factor, and then you will get different box plots by the different number of lanes separated out. If that, if the variable is a character, if the variable is just like words or strings or anything like that, it will do that by default. So again, we're going to talk today about factors and why kind of defining them on the fly could be good, but also defining them yourselves is good. So thing is, the thing is a number, right? Zero, one, two. If you write factor on that, it understands the order in which you usually want to do things. But when things are more categorical, creating factors themselves and telling it what order you want it to do it is probably um, for the best, um, rather than uh, R trying to figure them out for you, because otherwise it'll do like alphanumeric ordering, and sometimes that's not what you want, right? Because that's why that's why when I showed that plot of the states. Right? It was in order of like Wyoming to Alabama or whatever. Right? 
because it was in alphabetical order. That's how that box plot was showed. All right. <clears throat> so we didn't go over apply statements. Uh, we, I'm going to touch over on one of them after this kind of conclusion slide. So uh, apply statements are things that are things in R that do things repeatedly over a certain subset of things. Pretty much dplyr has made that obsolete um, by um, using group by and summarize. So group by and summarize together create a very powerful tool set that gives you a lot of the stuff you want to do. And grouping the data and mutating gives you, you know, a lot of the operations you, you want to do. So base R is a lot of good things for quickly summarizing rows or columns and numeric data. I still use hist and box plot because um, even creating a ggplot just takes a little bit more time. But again, um, if qplot is good starting out, if you don't, if you're not used to dollar signs yet, if you want to uh, make sure that you can get something done quick and be able to visualize data, qplot's really great for that. Um, again, matrix stats has some extensions for some of the things that you want to do. If you are like, I like column means, I like row means, I want to do column row operations, the matrix stats is a good package for that. So, um, okay, plots, plots, plots. Those, so if you, if you care, or if you're like, I want to see how it's done in base R, they are slides later in the deck. Um, so, sometimes, we're going to talk about data classes after this. So, we'll talk about data frames, we'll talk about vectors, we'll talk about matrices a bit. There's another, there's another type called lists. Lists are pretty general um, things that can contain you know, anything more or less inside them. So, like, element one could be like a Vector, element two could be like a matrix, element three could be like a data frame, element four could be like a model, right? So they're just like generic containers. For the most part, in this course, you will not need them except in one very specific condition. That condition is when you split strings. So let's say um, you have two characters, two, two things, right? So you want to say like, Patient ID 1, patient 2, okay? Strings, All right? So we're going to talk about string splitting, strings, split, we're going to split on spaces. So this, so there are, there are going to be um, really nice ways to split columns of a data set based on a separator, All right? We're going to talk about those. But sometimes you are splitting strings where you are doing something where you actually, you get back a list. Okay? So, this has weird syntax. We will go over it in more detail. But you're splitting a string. So this element has three things in it. This element has two things in it. Right? So, these are generic containers. And in order to operate over them, there are functions called apply statements. Right? So, L apply is one of them that applies a function to every, every, so if you say L apply strings, um, L, okay, so let me call this, so S is this is list. So if you say L apply S, D apply R first, which grabs the first element of anything. L apply, we'll go through. The first thing, grab the first, so go to the first element, grab the first thing, which is patient. The second element, grab the first thing. Right? I'm telling it for every single, go over every single thing, like a for loop in some respects, and do the first. Grab, grab something, perform some function. Okay? So we will talk about that when we do string splitting. We just want to briefly cover that, like, apply statements exist. There is a function, a uh, package called per r, which... I really like the package. I, I got to say, I'm not the biggest fan of the name because I tend to not put the three R's in there. So it is a way to work with lists and things like that um, in a more tidy verse kind of way. Um, but uh, we are not going to cover that in this course. So if we do show you some examples where you apply one L apply, um, which applies elements over a list, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. There is a package that hopefully is a bit more intuitive. 
and then we might even touch on s apply which is the same thing you apply a function over to elements of a list the only difference is this s means it tries to simplify it for you which i mean by that is instead of giving this thing back where it's an, a list again it says hey you know what you're just giving me one you're just giving me one uh, element one character thing like you're giving me one character string you know what you probably want a vector back i'll try to simplify that for you that's what that's called Again, this is outside of the dplyr, like kind of tidyverse framework, but we do need to touch on it very briefly because of strings. And again, you can forget all that because we'll probably cover it again when we talk about strings. But um, all right, any questions on summarization, plotting? So not not plotting in general, but kind of doing some quick plots to be able to explore your data. No? Alright, so I'm doing classes from Putin again. Alright. Alright. Who wants a break or who wants to keep going? Break. Alright. <laughs> Take a five minute break. I think I just saw that. Two colons. So the two colon signs mean uh, it's, it's only used for uh, package colon colon function. So the two colons mean this is a function in this package. So you're just being explicit as to which. So like again, like I, so package A, let's just say package A um, defines a function <laughs> called test. Package B defines a function called test. And you're like, you have both of them loaded, right? So the way R will work, it will take whichever test function you loaded the last. So let's say you, you did package A and package B. If you say test, just test on its own, the one from package B will run, okay? If you said package B and package A, if you loaded them, them in that order, the one from package A will run. So that's what's called a combo. So whenever you see, whenever you load a tidyverse, for example, you see that big report it says like these are the packages that are loaded, these are the conflicts, right? And you see that in the sense where it says like, so I'm going to restart, you only see that when you restart your session. So I'm going to restart R and I'm going to say library tidyverse, all right? So it's loading all these packages and then it says conflicts, tidyverse conflicts, dplyr colon colon filter masks stats colon colon filter, dplyr lag masks stats lag. So what that means is, like, so whenever you load up R, the, the basic package, you loaded one of them is stats, has a function called filter, has a function called lag. The flyer also has it. So if you want to say, like, you know what, I want to use the stats filter, right? You have to be explicit as to which package it's coming from. Okay, that's all it says. So um, we do that to be explicit in some of the notes, and also if you if you are um, if you are, uh, so like for example, like we don't do that for a lot of the tidyverse functions, or, or functions in the tidyverse packages, but we do that for a lot of the functions that are not in there. So you're like, hey, look, this isn't working for me. Like, what what gives, it's usually because that package isn't loaded, so we make sure we're explicit to say like, hey, that's from this package. If you don't have that package loaded, it might not work. Now, the other thing that's a little bit different, in order to use functions, you need to load that package. Technically, if you use the double colons, that will work if you just have that package. So let's say you're like, you know what, I want this like little great function from this package, but I don't feel like loading everything in. You can use the double colons just to use that function. Um, for so for example, if I want to use a filter, mm -hmm. and you know, I don't have a universe or things wires, you know, uh, as a library, I'm not using the character. Yep. Can I use like the, the flyer, the two colons yeah. filter, and you know, as if I'm using the filter function? Yes. Same thing. This yes. is how I should write it. Yeah, uh, yes. So you can do that. I would say for the most part, if you're starting out though, make sure you just load the library. No. Um, but again, there. so uh, I will say sometimes, the tide, so the tidyverse is great and it kind of works all together in like yeah. a system. Like there's not too many conflicts and stuff like that. 
Uh, I will say some new users like go gangbusters into packages and like you, you look at one of their scripts or something and it loads like 50 pa 15 packages or something, like that. which is fine, totally fine. But that causes the higher probability of conflicts. So if that happens and you and, and it's again if the order of the packages matter, if you don't put them in the order where you need for that function to be the right function. That's where they get a little bit confused on this. That's where the double columns really useful. Yeah? It's pretty cool. I'm excited. In that case, he initiated both tiny words and defier passwords or defier stats. Yes. So every time we want to use a filter, we should use the defier double columns. So, good question. So, when this says this masks this, it says whenever you call filter, this is the one it's using. So you don't have to be explicit if the dplyr one's the one you want, right? So if, if you want to use stats, then you have to be explicit. You have to write it like that. I'll you have to, yeah, exactly. So if I and and that's also you can you can uh you can tell some kind of when this happens in some respects uh, when you say like question mark filter. So if this comes up, if if the exact help file doesn't come up, but a couple choices come up, that usually means that function is available by a certain subset of packages that are already loaded. So here's the dplyr one, here's the stats one. So for example, let's run this. X is 1 to 100. We say filter x rep to 3. If we try to run this example, we're going to get pff, no dice. Again, because it's trying to run the dplyr version. So if you run stats filter, right? Then that says, hey, I want to use the stats filter function to, to get the, uh, the output. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's just really, um, again, because this ecosystem, so that like no one has, uh, no one has like dibs on function names, right? That like, um, you can make a package that has this function, the next person can, has, can make a package with this function. Um, so like you can both have them, they might then they can do totally different things. But if you want to use both those packages in the same script, you have to just be explicit as to which one you want if there's some masking going on. Okay. So that's why the tidyverse is really great, because it loads up a lot of functionality with not a lot of conflicts. Um, but again, like that will happen, the, the likelihood of it happening is higher the no, larger the number of packages you start loading. Okay. Does, does the JHER contain like every other like libraries that are the tidyverse and the supply or does not? So the JHER, the JHUR package, what, so it, when you install that, it installs all the packages you need for this class, but it doesn't load them up. So I have to load every time I have to load these five to get over six. So, so, the the so you, I would say for now, starting out, just load tidyverse. Just tidyverse. Yes. It will contain the rest. It will contain the majority of the things you want, and so I can go. Uh, let me go to the tidyverse website. But again, if I say library tidyverse, it'll tell you explicitly which packages were loaded, right? So ggplot2, tibble, tidyr, readr, perr, dplyr, stringr, and four cats. No. Those are the ones loaded. Now, we are going to talk about some other packages, right? We're going to use Lubridate in a, in a minute to work with dates. That's not loaded up here. So you have to be explicit in loading that one up. Um, uh, what, are, what is a... But yeah, for the most part... Uh, oh, so we talked about Broom. Broom's a great package for tidying up data, making things into data frames, things like that, but that's not loaded. So if you want broom, like if I just say tidy, it says I don't know what you're talking about, I have to load up the broom package for that to work. Okay, so again, the tidy verse is great, but it's just these eight packages loaded. If you want, for example, things like lubridate, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which is a really, really great package for dates, um, you have to be explicit. All righty. So... This is going to be uh, somewhat of the most technical kind of lectures in the entire series. So it's just getting like into the details of what things are, what classes are, things like that. So again, 
Here are the data types, right? This is the types of data more or less that are contained in your data sets, in your data frames. So one is a character, right? We've talked about that. Strings or individual characters, and they are quoted. The way, you, again, you make them, you have to put quotes around, right? Single quotes or double quotes. They both work. Numeric, any real numbers, right? So they're stored like one through five, you know, uh, 0.6 numerics, okay? Integers are a little bit different. Integers are whole numbers. So they're, they're different than numerics, um, because a lot of times if you're referencing something with like brackets or something like that or subsetting, it should be an integer. Like you wouldn't want to take the 5.6th row of the data set. That doesn't make sense. It's five or six, right? So that's why, that's how integers come into play. Also when we start to make sequences, one to a hundred, one to a thousand, those come back usually as integers. Factor. Factor is a categorical or qualitative variable. Right? So factors have essentially two components on them, the actual data and then the labels or the levels that that data has. Right? So for example, if you have someone taking someone's blood pressure and have it as high, medium, and low, the data is that person's individual high, medium, and low variable and then how that factor is ordered. Right? In that case, it's simple. Uh, like maybe low is the lowest, Middle, medium is the middle, high is the highest. But let's say you have another factor where it's like your propensity for living to 100, right? Maybe you want to set high to the lowest and so forth, right? So factors have two components, the actual data and the levels that you would assign to them. So that's important because if you start doing things with factors and putting in data to a factor that doesn't exist in the levels, Right? Let, let's say you have high, medium, and low, and then you're saying, well, this person's extremely high. Well, it says, hey, you didn't have that level there before. I don't know what, you, I don't know what to do with this. So it's, it, it does some things with that. For example, it sets that's the missing if it's not in the levels. We will talk about how to work with factors. Logicals, trues or falses, right? All caps, true, false, right? So it's variables that are just true or false, and we've been doing this already with filtering, right? Filtering takes in some sort of logical expression, similarly with if else, right? So we say, is data solved equal to zero? That returns trues and falses and misses, if, if the data is missing. So again, we've already been working with logicals, but if you want to compose them or make them, you just put all caps true, all caps false, no quotes around them. That's what they are. And again, one of the most important ones that isn't in the standard kind of deck is dates. And they're also sometimes called POSIX CT or POSIX LT, right? So that's the way you might see it if you say class on these things. If you say class on the variable, you, you will get one of these options for the most part. Yes? What if it's no way to translate cells strange ways like they would come to uh, Yes and no. Yes, there is. Uh, you the numeric dates you can turn back into actual dates. You have to specify the origin, which I forget what Excel is. Is either like January first, nineteen seventy, or January first, nineteen sixty, or January first, nineteen hundred. The majority of software uses January first, nineteen seventy. Um, no idea why that was chosen as the date, but that's usually what it is. But if it comes in as a character, don't worry about it. You can do that already. So is it? You'd actually. So oddly, you'd prefer it to come in as like. <laughs> 1 slash 7 slash 2014, as long as you know which, which one is month and which one is day. All right. So again, these are the data types. We've used the class variable before to show you what they are. Again, we've showed you C to collect data together, Andrew and Jaffe, two character strings. We put them together. You see the class is character, class 147. If you... By default, even though 1, 4, and 7 are whole numbers, it treats it as a numeric. It says, like, hey, you probably want, like, just real numbers here. You don't want to worry about, like, rounding and just whole numbers. So, again, this will tell you the data type in there. Also, um, one uh, in uh, tibbles at the top, it says DBL, right, for certain things. Instead of numeric, that's technically a double. All you need to know is that it can contain fractions. Okay? So, if in the top of a data frame, it'll say CHR for character. FCT for factor. DBL just means double, so it's just a numerical variable. If it says INT, that stands for integer. 
okay? So, um, although for the majority, so you don't need to know like anything about like how much is stored or anything like that. Numerics are doubles, doubles are numerics, right? So it's just, it just doesn't say N-U-M at the top. All right, integer is a special subset of numeric that contains only whole numbers. Uh, a, a lot of times it's good for subsetting, things like that. Um, so we are going to introduce a function called seq, S-E-Q. That will give you a sequence. So many times you want to do a sequence, for example, from 1 to 5. Right? Gives you numbers 1 to 5. The class of that is integer. Seek doesn't always give you, uh, doesn't always give you integers. You can do 1 to 5 by 0.2 or whatever. But that will give you a sequence of numbers, sequence of whatever you want by whatever set you want. Okay, so seek is kind of a helpful function sometimes when you want to do things um, kind of outside of the data set. So, but in this case, if we say from 1 to 5, those are whole numbers, it gives us these back, and the class of that is an integer. So if you see that in a data set, that pretty much means they're just whole numbers. Now, why is this really, really, really important? When we've run in data before, sometimes it says, hey, there are problems in this data set, right? We, Andrew showed you that function stop for problems and the function problems to identify. Now, read underscore CSV. We've talked about those arguments. It guesses what is the type of the data coming in. Right? So what it does, by default, if you don't explicitly tell it what are the column types, this one's a numeric, this one's an integer, this one's a character, that one's a date. Right? If you don't tell that explicitly, it will look at the first thousand rows. Now, First thousand rows, for example, age, everybody's got a whole number, so I say, like, hey, they're whole numbers. I'm gonna make it an integer. Then the next person comes in and they're like 14.6. It says, that's not a whole number. But you told, like, I guessed, and I guessed whole number. You didn't tell me to, anything else. These are whole numbers, these are integers. So what it does is it actually sets that's the missing. So that's a very scary premise. That's why I'm using that call types argument in read underscore CSV. Or using the, the, there's an argument called guess underscore max, what is the maximum number of rows you can guess? If you can put that as infinity, it'll slow down the reading and writing, but it won't ever run into that problem. Now, that is the big important difference between integers and numerics. Integers can contain fractions and uh, anything after a period or a decimal point. Sorry, integers cannot contain them, numerics can. So now, if you see a data set where one of the columns is an integer and it was read in that way, and you're like, I knew somebody had like 14.8 in there. There might be a problem with that data set. Yeah? What is the advantage of <sighs> um, A certain, so storage. So, so that's one. So if the data set is like billions or trillions of rows, like that you can, it doesn't have as large of a memory, memory f footprint. Also, uh, like subsetting, things like that. Um, so some sort of faster operations, but uh, in most respects, it doesn't have much more of a benefit or a range. But again, we're not introducing it to like say like, oh, make sure your column is an integer. Make sure that's the case. It's You might have run into a problem where it guessed it was an integer. And also, if you say class on something and you're like, oh, these are numbers, but it says integer, we wanted to introduce this to so you know that like that class exists. So when it does the guessing, mm -hmm. is, um, is it doing it for, for each column individually? Exactly. So here, call underscore types, you can explicitly set, and, and I think in the examples it shows you how to explicitly set the column type to be like double, or which is a numeric, right? Um, but again, here you can also say uh, n max or guess max. So guess max is minimum of a thousand. You could say like 20,000 rows. I think, you know, 20,000 rows should have pretty much all the variability in there. Or you could actually put guess max to be infinity. So it'll read the entire data before trying to figure out, like literally the INF with a capital I, it'll, it'll read the entire data set before, before trying to guess. Uh, a lot of those speed ups are for just trying to guess. Sorry, the guessing provides speed ups to reading the data. Um, I don't know. Um, so here, for example, call types, uh, they say, they're saying, like, for example, it's a double. I think in the in the help. Um, so here you can you can either specify calls underscore character, calls underscore double, or you can say like a 
just D for double or C for character for all of them, and then afterwards you can uh, you can change them. And we I think we show you an example of that in in one of the homeworks. So there's a shorthand way to make sequences. So some, a lot of times you might just want to make like numbers from like one to hundred, give some temporary data, things like that. So the colon, single colon, not double colon, single colon, one colon five will give you sequence from one to five. Okay. So logical, only two possible elements, true or false, also n, right? If it only has real two two possibilities, but it could also be missing, right? So uh, X is true, false, true, true, false. So if we say class X is logical, um, and here we're going to introduce a set of functions called the is functions, right? Is 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 dot and then a class. Is dot numeric gives you a logical test, true or false? Is it numeric? The answer is no. Which it doesn't say is each one of these things numeric. Is this entire vector numeric or not? Okay, because remember vectors can only have one type in it. Either you have characters, or you have numerics, or you have logicals. can only have one thing. Vectors only can contain one thing at a time. So when we say, is that numeric, it gives us one value back. So is that vector true, uh, numeric, yes or no? The answer is false. Is it a character? Yes, it is. Okay? So logical elements are not in quotes. If I say true, false, true, true, uh, true, false, true, false, and I put them in quotes, class of that, R doesn't care. R doesn't care that it is true and false in there. It says you put quotes around it, I'm treating it as a character. Okay? Say so class that as a character. Now, almost as all the is functions exist, there are functions called as functions. Is it numeric? Is it a character? Is it a logical? And then you say as, change it, coerce it. Try to do what you can to make it to what I want it to be. So you say as dot logical. So you're saying like, hey, trues and falses make them really trues and falses and, and so again also note logicals when you print when you print that one out it's gonna have quotes around it when you plot print this one out doesn't have any quotes around it it's logical true or false doesn't have any quotes not a character so as that logical you have coerced that's the name that's the terminology in R you have coerced that vector from a character into a logical now it will give you warnings it says like hey I don't know what's going on there like, you tried to make a character into a numeric or something like that, and I don't know how to translate the word John into a number, so it's going to it's gonna convert those into NAs. <clears throat> okay? So, super important, and what we're going to talk about in the data cleaning, where you have, like, dollar sign 1,000 for money, and you say as.numeric. R says, I don't know what a dollar sign is. I don't know how to convert that to a, you know, a numeric. There are some nice helper functions that get around that. But at the end of the day, you should or could be explicit about taking out the dollar sign and then turning it into a number. Now, um, some and mean work on logical vectors, right? So logicals, true or false, treats trues as ones, false as zeros. So really helpful when you say sum. Sum as the logical says there's two, two trues in there. Mean will give you the percentage of trues. So you want to calculate a table that says, like, what is the percentage of our data set that is female? You can say mean column uh, sex equals equals female or something like that. Or age is greater than 46. Some of that, mean of that, will give you the, the, tally, the tallies and the sums that you want. And again, I've already showed you very briefly that these sums... Uh, on logical vectors are really important when we talk about missings. So like I said before, there's is dot character, is dot logical, all that kind of stuff. There's also, which I've already introduced, is dot na. Is it missing? Yes? As tries to change it, tries to coerce it, tries to take it from one data type into another. So here, we're saying, hey, I have this data set, it read the trues and falses in its characters, I don't really know why, or actually I do know why, one of them had some weird value in there, I changed that value, now I know it's all true or all false, I want to now treat that as a logical, I want to be able to manipulate that with that subset based on that, filter based on that, but I have to change it first to a logical, and the way you do that is as that logical, it changes the actual data type. But again, if it doesn't understand how to change a certain element of that into the other data type, it'll treat it'll convert it to NA. Okay. Um, so this is again, this is uh, 
So is that pretty much what we were talking about? The is classes, as classes, there should be a, uh, is for testing, as for coercion or changing. Okay? So again, we can convert numbers to characters all day. As that character, one, four, and seven, says like, hey, I know how to do that. I'll just put quotes around it, treat it as words. Now, if I say this, which we've talked about on day one, if I do this and then I say divide by five, right, no dice, right? Because if I do this, divide by three, I get numbers. But after I convert it to characters, it says, I don't care if there's all numbers in there. You told me it's a character. Right? And just like we did before when we combined X and Y together on the day one, we created that both variable. It coerced, it coerced the two uh, data types together. And, and so there's like a hierarchy. It says like, I know how to convert essentially numbers into characters. You essentially put quotes around them, but it doesn't go the other way. It doesn't say, I know how to take characters like Andrew and Jaffe and make them numeric. I don't know how to make that a number. So it gives you a warning and it turns them to NAs. All right. So factors. Factors are special as a special character vector where the elements have predefined groups or levels. And if you do not specify the levels, they will be defined in alphanumeric order. So again, you can think of this as qualitative or categorical variables to so say x is a factor, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl. Now, when we print out x, note, it doesn't have quotes around it, so you know it's not a character. It's not numbers, so you know it's not numeric. And factors have this additional thing that say levels. So you plot it out, it says boy, girl, boy, girl, and it gives you the levels of this factor. Right? This is very different than other languages, for example, like with Stata. The nice thing, the great thing about this is you can still do tests on this. So you can say, like, is this equal to girl or is this equal to boy? You don't have to remember what order it was in. Right? So you can still say, like, this. So x is this. x equals boy. True or false? Doesn't matter what level it was. I don't care. But when I do plotting or summarization or any of the things that we have done so far with a factor, it will do it or plot it and return it in the order of the levels. Okay? So, for example, you want a table and you're like, I always wanted to be in this, these rows together and that kind of thing. I want the table to work like that. Great. Also, for most of the arguments, so, so factors will allow you to do that as long as you specify the levels, but otherwise it's going to do it in alphanumeric order. Also, if you're doing tables and things like that, there are arguments that tell you, do you want to drop levels or not? So like, for example, let's say you had five different levels of a, of a, you know, a treatment and nobody got treated to level four. Do you still want a row that says treatment level four is zero? Sometimes you do. Right? In other languages, sometimes that could be a nightmare to try to get it to, get it to work. For example, Stata. Um, so if you define a factor with that specific level, there are ways to have rows or tabulations where it still puts zeros in those things, even if it's not observed in your data. Okay? So again, if we say class, this is a factor. Um, we already talked about that. So this is one of the big reasons why we say re use read underscore CSV. So read.csv has an argument called strings as factors. So pretty much the idea was this, I think, when it was kind of written. It's like most people are going to have like, you know, Excel spreadsheets. We're going to read them in. We're going to help you out. The columns with characters, you probably want them as categorical variables. We'll help you out. We'll de by default term as factors. That, for most intents and purposes, is a terrible idea because people give you some of the dirtiest data you can imagine and you need to clean Right? Read underscore CSV, the things we talked about in the read our package, do not make that assumption. They will never take a character of like ages or name or names. If they have something that's non-numeric in there, it will not assume that you want to take that into a factor. It assumes for the most part, you get that data, you're probably gonna do some cleaning, define the factors yourself, define the levels yourself. Okay? So um, that is one of the big reasons. So I think a lot, it's, it's, not conf it's confusing in the beginning that read.csv exists. Why are we not using it? Why are we using this other thing? It's because the default behavior is, so there's a lot of reasons. One, it's faster. Two, the default behavior is better, right? And three, um, factors do not, factors come in as factors, okay? Yeah? Can factors be used for a higher level analysis? 
So what do you need? Statistical. What kind? I mean, um, multi-level modeling things. Um, I, you can, yeah. You you. So here you say you tell it what the levels are. So here's here's the actual uh, arguments for vectors. So x is a character vector. So you put in a character, right? The levels that you want to give it. So um, there are two arguments that are a little bit confusing in some respects. There's levels and levels and labels. So sometimes, like, uh, let's say it was here. Let me see. Uh, okay. So let's say the character is like low, medium, and high, and you specify the levels as actually high, medium, and low. So it's going to order them in the right way. But actually, you want the labels to be, you know. High blood pressure, normal blood pressure, low blood pressure. Okay? So, when all is said and done, high, medium, and low go here. T high, medium, and low tells you what the order that they're in. But actually, when, it's, when the factor is actually created, it now will say high blood pressure, low blood pressure, um, normal blood pressure. Right? So, that's the difference between labels and levels. For the most part, I change all the characters that I never use labels, more or less ever. I essentially will change whatever I want in the character vector and then make the levels the things I want in the order I want it to. Now, the other thing is, I don't use them that much, but they are very useful in a lot of analyses. Ordered levels. So, why do you care about an ordered level, right? One of the reasons is you can actually do greater than, less than, greater than, or equal to on an ordered factor. For example, if you have low, medium, high, extremely high, right? then you can actually say, so like low, medium, high, extreme. But again, oh no, it's alphanumeric, right? So I actually don't want to do this. I want, so this is actually, a, so let's assume this is like a whole vector, but I want to say the levels are equal to this. Okay, so I want to say x is greater than extreme, uh, high. Ah. I think this is, so I don't use this that much, but I know you can do logical operations on it. Um, oh, no. Ordered equals true. So for a ordered vector, you can actually do this type of operation. I tend to not do this, but um, some people find it very useful for factors that really have an inherent ordering. Uh, I would probably do like equals equals or percent in percent talk about in a minute say like is x in high or extreme but again you can do this type of thing which is really useful for filtering right it gives you a logical back anything that gives you a logical back you can do filtering on right so all those is functions all that kind of stuff all right now percent in percent so if you use stata there's a function called in list not, not to like list in the army, like in list, like inside the list, right? <clears throat> I am. So, what does this do? So, x is 0, 2, 2, 3, 4. We say x equals 0, or with the pipe, x equals 2. Again, sorry, I understand that the pipe operator is that percent, greater than percent. Uh, I will try to call out the pipe operator. The logical pipe is that vertical. So x equals equals 0, or x equals equals 2. It says true, 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 false, false, false. So x is equal to 0. That one comes up true. These two come up true because we see this option to say x equals 2. Now, one of the big uh, things is, well, that kind of syntax is totally fine if you're doing like one or two things. Like, it's not a big deal. But like, you're like, I want to say, is x in this list or not? Is x in this set of elements? Right? Is x 0, 2, 6, 8, 10, right? Writing that top thing over and over again becomes very cumbersome, very long winded, right? A lot of copy and pasting, which means you probably have errors. So the percent in percent operator. So means x percent in percent 0, 2. So saying, I want to look at this vector and 
in this list, is it in there, yes or no? It returns trues or falses, and the length will be exactly the same length as the original vector. So now, uh, returns true if x is in 0 or 2. This can be as long as you want. It can be, it can be another variable if you want. Right? For example, if I say this, so x percent, uh, let's say y is 0, 4. x percent in percent y. Get trues or falses. It can be a variable in there. But it, the thing you need to know is the left hand side is being tested against the right hand side. So the left hand side is the thing we really care about. Is x in this list? Right? And in this list can have a whole number of elements. Anything like that. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Excuse me? So there, uh, in is a special word in R. So like for uh, for loops, things like that, the word in um, means something else. Right? So it's just, that's the way they define the operator. Uh, so... Again, for the most part, I will, we will talk about NAs in a little bit. For the most part, whenever you're doing filtering, it will, if you say like x equals equals 5, right? If the data is NA, it's going to be dropped. If x, is, if x is missing, it's going to be dropped, right? So pretty much uh, if you're doing vectors and things like this, which we're talking about, you have to worry about NAs. Right? If you want to keep them, if you don't. You have to worry about keeping them if you don't and, and filtering as well in the data set. But I'm saying that the logical operations are a little bit different in filter in here. Right? Percent in percent will never, ever return anything but literally trues and falses. It will never return an NA. Okay? This up here, the logical operations, it, it is possible that they can return an NA because... At least, at least that's the way, the way they're defined. They're defined. They are defined. So, like I said before, NA and R is like I don't know. I don't know if that answer is. I don't. That that number could be two, two or zero. I don't know, right? So, in reality, if you have a missing value, it doesn't know. It doesn't know if it is two or zero. If that's the way you're testing it, right? So, a lot of times, not always, not always, uh, NAs will come up as NA if you test on them. But in dplyr, when you filter, the NAs are removed, right? You have to be explicit if you want to say, like, I want to know, I want to keep if the age is greater than 56 or it's missing, okay? You have to write that into your statement. And again, like, this is not uncommon compared to, like, Stata, where you have to, like, make sure that thing is, like, greater than 5 but less than, like, infinity or whatever. Um, I'm, not, I'm not bashing Stata, it's just I... When going back to that, um, when I go back to that, I forget that a lot, and I'm just like, oh, like now I have all these dots. Um, and then if you've ever tried to use like the multi-dot paradigm, where like period is infinity, period A is greater than period, period Z is greater than period A, that's like a whole another game altogether. Yeah. Nope. Totally fine. Yep. Um, yeah, like... Uh, this is my... This is my... Hey, oh, this is the one I usually... Let's go. Oh, come on. Percent and percent. Like, hey. Right. And then it's like... And it could be anything else. Like, hey... Ah, uh, no. Right? That list, so it doesn't matter that, like, this is, so this is just a lookup table to check against, right? So it's saying, like, is it, is any of these things, is this, 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 this? Right? It doesn't have to be, um, <clears throat> so characters and numerics, for the most part, is the only things you use it for. Uh, logicals doesn't, you could technically do it, but it doesn't make sense, right? You could just use, so it's like, is it true? You would just use it. it. It's either true or false. And if you wanted to like revert that, like true, sorry, true, false, and you want to say, well, I want to reverse it, you would use like the not operator. You wouldn't use. You tend to not use like true. That's not. It's kind of. Uh, can you go up a little 
Oh yeah, yeah, that's. In the second sentence, if like you say, like uh, the person in person sign, then mm -hmm. see instead of hey blah blah hey, what happens there? Does it show true under hey as well? So it says true under hey. Yeah, the second C, the second C. Yeah. If we change the order there. The order, yeah, doesn't matter. Yep. The, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, so I, that was a bad example on my end. So it doesn't matter where it is in the list. Good question. It's just checking against the entire table. But if you're to say equals equals is a totally different question, right? That's element wise comparison, and it'll give you a warning, right? So it says, is this equal to exactly that in order? So equals equals and percent and percent are very different. Right, so percent and percent is like a lookup table to say like, hey, this is a table of, of like things I want to check for. Here's, it's doing element-wise comparisons. Okay. All right, let's go to the data classes lab. And we're going to do part one in there. So, yeah, let's... Data Classes Lab. And again, uh, if you have kind of R started up, it's not a bad idea to go to a session, restart R, and kind of start from like, you know, clears everything out, kind of starts up from the ground up. And then make sure, again, you do, uh, even for question one, just click the button where you run everything up until this point so it loads the data, it loads the libraries up for you, right? So again, restarting the session with session, restart R, and then going, and before you start running this, running all the code chunks up until this point. So it'll read all the packages you need in there, and it'll read in the data set um, for the bike data sets. That it is. Show that. Mm -hmm. Terrible. 
couple examples show. Yeah. Let's see how you do a box plot. Especially because like now it's like obsolete. Yeah. There's <laughs> a way to easily pop out that window into a separate tab. I know you can say like, optional windows equals no, but like always haven't popped out. Like, but you can zoom. Uh, no, but you make a new plot, it's gonna like pop back in. Like, if you minimize that panel. Mm. No, but like minimize the, the plot panel. Like, mm. You can just have the code. I try it. See mm. what pops it up. You can do like options of like window something, but like it's my one call with that. Also, is there a way in the through in the text editor to like just duplicate the line? Is there a shortcut for that? For copy and paste? Yeah, but just like do it because I'm like that plus plus. If I do like Control D, it'll just copy the exact line again, which is nice for like just changing a variable you want to like plot or like do regression and stuff. Mm. I don't believe there is. That's like that's also kind of annoying. I think they would probably. Yeah, I use that way more than you would think. But you shouldn't be doing that. You're just making a gen general ggplot2 object and just adding things to it. No, no, no. If I'm like saying like I want to look at the distribution between like age and like gender, then like outcome and gender and like. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. You should create a ggplot2 object and then add in the other. I think you should be general upper plot necessarily. I'm just doing like regression of like little things against like age. Yeah, I'm just like duplicate check and duplicate. Then you should do L apply or something. Like that's, I th I'm just saying I think that's I probably longer, like, against what um, what their philosophy is, so they probably wouldn't implement it. That's one game. It's probably my most used shortcut. I mean, that's fair. I mean, I don't use that many short. I mean, besides like copy and paste and stuff, obviously. Have like, you ever copy line and paste it right below and do something to it? Yeah. I mean, Alright, let's see where everybody's at. Yeah. 
Um, so it just gives you like a uh, code yeah, piece nice. that like, has something in order already. Kind of you just gave so that extra factor call than having to like collect them all on one route. So you use flags and use them like a force flag. I use it a bit now. So here, especially when you have like a lot of the large factor that has a bunch of levels. Like if you want to reorder some yourself, you just have to like next command. I'm just going to go over this. All right. So let's go over one and two, and then we'll, we'll break down for three. All right. So here's the deal. Data is loaded up. So get all the different types, bike types, from the type column. So again, we can use sort unique. Again, we didn't show you sort yet, but take a wild guess. Sort's a vector. All right. So if I say sort unique... I can say bike dollar sign type. This tells me if I if I turn type into a factor, it's gonna go in this order. Boulevard is gonna be first, bike lane is gonna be first, contra blow, all that kind of stuff. Now, um, at least when I was starting out in R, I was like, you know, I want the I want to get that vector, but like I need to write it in code. I need to actually like copy and paste this over here. Like I want to copy and paste this, and, like move these things around. And like say like this is the levels I want to do, right? Does that make sense? So that is so you will not use D put a lot, if at all, in some respects. So we said D B types. So B types, right? This is an object in R, but sometimes you actually want to grab that vector and put it into code. So D put. We'll take a vector, we'll take a lot of things, but you really for a vector, and then it'll turn it into something that you can actually copy and paste. That's actual R code. Okay? This is really helpful to me for levels. So for example, bike boulevard, bike lane, conch flow, shared bus. If I got a data set in and I was like, you know what? Like here, I, I got this data and I wanted to check. Like let's say I have a, an if statement or something where I'm like, you know what? If new data comes in and it's not in one of these levels, Error, let me know. Let me know some new kind of data came in. Right? I can do that with percent in percent, right? I can say, is all my new data in these things, right? I want to say like check type in percent in percent, and then there's ways I can say are all of them in there? False. No. How'd that happen? Well, Simple reason, some of them are missing. Right? So it says, are all of them in there? Right? I could say, or is that NA bike type? This should come up true. And I can write some functions around it just to make sure that if a new data set came in, new bike data came in, if this wasn't the case, it would stop, it would alert me. All right. So, really, this might be very confusing, but the idea is D put the only thing we are introducing this for is to show you that if you're like, I have something over here that I want to actually get the code that would I would could run to recreate this object, dput will do that for you. Might look super weird, might look super complicated, but dput, that's the purpose of that. Now, these are the levels. So again, B types, if we just say factor, so if I do this outside of my, if I said factor, Factor type, bike dollar sign type. I said, show me a couple of them. Again, this is the deal. 
like the, it would show me the levels and it would put it in alphabetical order. And if we want to say like, you know, B types, like that's exactly what we saw. If we sorted that, that will tell us the order we're going. You know what? I don't want that to be the order. I want side path to be first. Okay? So that's why we're defining lev. So lev is a character vector. It's not associated with bike in any way. That data set. So reorder the output of the dput so side path is first. We've already given that code here. It's right here. Just moved it around. All right, so lev is that. Recode type as a factor using this vector of levels. Okay. So how am I? How do you change columns in a data set? What's the verb? Mutate. We're gonna say we're gonna reassign type. We're gonna make it a factor, right? Now, first thing in factor, what do we? First thing we put in there, the actual thing we want to make into a factor. In this case, type. Levels. Now, this is the name of the game. We want to explicitly tell what the levels are, and the levels are this character vector that we made. Now, all this is going to do is recode type as a factor, but it's not going to do anything. It's not going to make it stick unless we reassign bike to that. All right? So we're saying take bike, mutate, the type column, we're going to make it into a factor with these explicit levels, and then we're going to reassign it to bike to make sure it sticks into that data set. Does that make sense? What does it make sense about that statement? Yes? I think I'm having a little bit of trouble figuring out. This information already lives in the bike data set. How can we pull it out on the next bike? We pulled it out because we want to. So in order for you to make a factor with the levels that you want, you have to explicitly tell it the levels, right? So you can either grab that into a vector like b-types, and then you have to move it around yourself with code, or you can explicitly tell the levels. So now, here is the reason why I would say this is better than like grabbing it and moving it around. This is explicit. You can look at the code and say, like, oh, what is the order of the levels just by looking at the code? And it's right here. I mean, we don't have to assign it to something. We could copy. Like, it doesn't matter if we do that there, if we do that right there. Copy and paste. It doesn't matter. It's just a little bit cleaner if we define the levels and then set the levels. Okay? And note, this is something different that we haven't done before. This is a vector that lives outside the data set. It just lives in R somewhere. We can still use that in a mutate function. So... That is totally fine. Now, if just so happens we had a column in the data set, column in the data set that was called lev, that would introduce some problems. Because by default, mutate, dplyr says like, hey, you're working with this data? I know the columns you want to work with, all the columns of the data set. So if you had a column called lev, it wouldn't look and find this. It would say, you want to you use that, you want to use that column, which is a problem. That's why we made sure to make this name something that was not a column in this data set, just to be clear. So now, after this is done, the difference between just running factor on this is now, if we do table bike, let's just look at bike type. Let's just look at the first some set, set of things. Oh, I didn't run this. We see data hasn't changed a bit. Bike Boulevard, Site Path, all that. Nothing's changed with respect to the content of the data. The difference is level one is now Site Path because that's what we said was the first level. Does that make sense? Is that, is that clear why we, we had that lev vector to explicitly order the way we wanted it ordered? Okay? As. Yes. So. No, 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 no. They're te okay. So. It's a good question. So. Um, 
There is a function called as that factor, right? The problem with it is, is it does that function itself doesn't let you explicitly tell the levels. The function factor lets you tell the levels. As that factor just says, I'm going to convert this character into a factor. I am not. I'm just going to use the order that I assume alpha and beta. So as that factor exists, that's a good question. As that factor exists, we don't. I would not recommend you using that. The factor function will work fine on its own. Right. So technically. In here, it says like x needs to be a vector of data, a vector or like a character. Technically, that's not 100% true. Remember, b types b types is the original alphanumeric ordering, right? B types is the sorted thing, alphanumeric, all that kind of stuff. So if I run this, just run this command where I say factor type, factor type. So the factor function will take in either characters or if you pass it in a, a factor in the background, it'll just convert that to a character on its own. So here we said e explicit about the levels, we want side path to be first. And then later we were like, actually, you know what, we want a factor to B types. It doesn't say like, hey, this is already a factor, I'm gonna tell you that's a bad idea. It's gonna say like, hey, you put in a factor that was already there, you explicitly said the levels, that's fine. I'll recode it as a factor the way you want it. That's totally, that's not a problem, right? So again, um, the big downside, so use factor when you're creating factors, even if the data is already a factor. You don't have to convert it back to a character and then go back. You just use factor, again. So um, there is, so some people, I don't know why uh, they really want this sometimes, but there is a very, very spe sometimes specific substance where you, so instance where you're like, you know what? I want to know what level that is, the number. So if you say as dot numeric on a factor, yeah. um, you can do that. I will suggest that if you are doing that, it's probably not the best idea. And the reason for that is all the operations you've learned with like categorical data in the past. Like you can do those operations in a much cleaner way just working with the factor. Because you want to say like, you know, um, I don't know, maybe maybe a better question is why would you want to do that? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm literally asking. I, I don't do that. That might make sense. For me, my, my uh, flow, for example, put the actual levels in there and don't have an associated key. But it does make sense from that perspective. Totally fine. So if you, you can do it. You can turn it into America if you want. But again, the links, the links are broken from the original data. Now, also note, this says, this is the first level, this is the second level, this is the third level. That matters the order in which you put the levels in. Okay, so if I said level one was side path, and then turn it into numeric, wherever side path would be number one. If I said side path was number two, and I convert it into numeric, side path, the number is going to be two now. Okay. Alrighty, so again, big take home messages. Factor doesn't need to necessarily take in a character, it can also take in a factor, but be explicit about the levels. Now, nice thing about this, when I run this for the last time, now, if I say table bike, table bike type, or if I do the counting or whatever, if I do bike, uh, let's say count type, either one of these things, you will note that the order in which they are in, the order which they return back is now in the order of the factor. Okay? So, and like I said before, If I added another level, if I said like, you know, side path, all that kind of stuff, when you do table and when you do counts and that kind of stuff, so a uh, count doesn't uh, have, I believe, options for dropping them. But for example, table, now, although there were no instances where the factor was leveled at nothing, it gave you a zero there. So even if it didn't find 
an instance of that that level, it still gave you a zero. The other way is a problem. So the way I mean what I mean by that is when you are defining the levels, make sure 100 percent of the time that you cover all the levels of your data. Okay? We made sure that we explicitly defined uh, levels to have side path, bike boulevard, bike lane, contra flow, shared bus bike, shower, sign route. We made sure of that. I'm just going to say, let's say one to two. What if I did this? Whoa, what happened there? I said type is a factor, but it only had these two levels. So what happened was, it said, hey, I found some other stuff. You didn't tell me those levels exist. You know what? They're not levels in this factor. They're set to missing. So make sure when you're creating factors and defining the levels that all the data is, is covered. Otherwise, it will take things that you didn't explicitly set a level to and turn it to missing. All right. Again, um, we're not gonna. We're just gonna go. We're not gonna uh, break off and go over this. That was the whole take-home message for question three. We did the exact same thing. Just called it type two. Just we didn't define the. We defined the levels as only these three. Everything else is turning into NA. Alrighty. Factors can be confusing, but um, again, really powerful at the end of the day. Any questions before we move on? All right. Um, Listen, there's a levels function. There's a levels function that allows you to do two things with it. One, if you say levels on a factor, it returns a character vector to the levels. That's kind of nice. Sometimes you want to know the levels of the factor you have. It's really, really great. For extracting the levels of, of the factor. Now, CC, we make a factor case control, case control. Again, it'll put in alphanumeric order. Now, there is a way you can reset the level uh, using the level function. Never, ever, ever do that. Use the factor function. The reason for that is this slide right here. We said factor is case control, case control. The levels are case and control. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to change the levels with the levels function. And it's actually, I want it to be control case. What did it do to the data? It changed it, but it actually flipped the labels completely. Right? Record one, when you read it in, was a case. Had a disease or whatever. After you change the levels that way, it's a control. That's why the levels function to reassign levels is terrible. But if you were to make this and you just say, like, I want to know the levels, totally fine. Levels, CC, perfectly fine. It tells you the levels. Do not use it for reassignment. Take them as if I can't beat it home strong enough. Just use factor to make factors. Okay? Um, again, this is the way you would do it. You'd actually explicitly set the levels. You would, uh, and again, you can do order equals true, but you would just say factors. Even if it's already a factor, if you want to re-level the things, you just give it that, and it'll, can, it'll change the levels you want to. Um, there is a function called re-level. Again, you can use it. It probably, it's kind of a convenience for changing like the base level, but at the end of the day, I would always feel more comfortable just being explicit with the levels I would give for a factor. Um, again, this is already something we talked about. You can technically turn a factor into a numeric. Just use as that numeric. It'll change it, and it will replace the uh, the record with the number um, of which which level it is. So as that numeric and the levels function together. Together, give you all the information of a factor. Yep. Uh, again, you can use as that character. Like you're like, oh, okay, I use it as a factor. I love that, but I want to use it as a character now. I feel more comfortable with that. You can use as that character on a factor. It won't. It will just pretty much say you're a character. Uh, you have no levels anymore. Um, yeah, you're a character. Um, so uh, sometimes people uh, have asked about certain specific functions that we put in here. Rep is a, re is a function to repeat something over and over again. So rep, boy, girl, each of them, you want to repeat them 50 times. 
what that will give you is boy 50 times, girl 50 times. BG2 is rep boy girl. There's a different argument in rep called times equals 50. The difference between that is this will repeat boy 50 times, girl 50 times. This will repeat boy girl, boy girl, boy girl 50 times over. They're still they're the same length. This is 100, this is 100, but the order in which they did the repetition is a little bit different. We've talked about if else. Again, you put in a logical test. What happens if it's true? What happens if it's false? You can nest these things. So you say, if else, some sort of test. If it's true, you can replace with a value. If no, you can put another if else in there. Say like, is it this? Yes, put in the value five. If not, if else, is it equal to six? Put in something else. So they can be deeply nested if you like. So we're gonna be using the circulator data. Um, again, here's a simple example. If we, oh, we're talking about the daily ridership, if the daily ridership is greater than 10,000, we're going to call it low to high or high. Otherwise, it's going to be called low. And high rider is we're going to turn into a factor, and we're going to say the levels are low to high. And here's an example of what we have. If we do a table, low is the first element in that table because we set the order specifically. Otherwise, it would have done it alphanumerically. High would have been first. Again, you can do this with in mutate. So here we're in inside. So this is done outside of kind of the data set. This is now a vector that's kind of disjointed from the data set completely. But you normally you'd want to do this with in mutate. You don't have to use the dollar signs, any of that stuff. So here we're creating that exact same variable. We're not turning it into a factor, but we're just selecting some of those things. And again, you see it is a character. But then uh, you can use this same function right here, thin mutate to make it a factor itself. So again, I'm showing you that if else statements can be nested. So you have an if, if else is the daily ridership less than 10,000, call it low. Otherwise, is it greater than 20,000, call it high. Otherwise, call it me, uh, um, medium. So pretty much if you had a value of 10,001, right, this will come up false. So you go to this one. Here it will come up false. You'll be in the middle. So anything with respect to 10,000 to 20,000 inclusive will be called medium. Everything else above that will be called high. Everything else will be called low. NAs will be NAs, uh, I believe, right? NAs will probably be called, I, I, yeah, yes, there'll be, there is an option on if else to be called, um, it w they will be they will be missing. I just want to show you a different function really quick. Read circulator rider levels. So if we table it, table use NA. I don't know. Oh yeah, there definitely are missing values here in this data set. So again, if it fails all those tests, if it's missing for all those tests, it's going to come up as NA. It's not going to be assigned to any of those. Um, Factors you can explicitly do that, but you have to put in more logical statements here if it's like if it's NA as well. Then we can factor them low, medium, and high. You can order them, but you don't necessarily have to. Uh, also, uh, a lot of times if you want to do something like that, there's a function called cut, which will cut a data set, a numeric ve uh, vector up, and cut it based on the number of breaks you give it. So the breaks are kind of the, where the cut points you want it to be, and then the behavior of where, how you want the lowest value of that break to be included is include that lowest equals false. So uh, cut will return a, um, will return a factor. Again, you can also order the result. Uh, right equals true says instead of the lowest, do you want the right side of the break to be included or not? So if you said one of the breaks is 50 and the value is actually equal to 50, do you want that included or do you want that to be put to the next level. So um, by default, the labels are constructed in the standard kind of math notation. So left being a parenthesis, comma right with a bracket. And uh, the parenthesis means it's not included. The bracket means it is inclusive. You know, um, if you've never seen that, uh, go way, way back to like uh, line segments and all that kind of stuff with brackets and parentheses. Um, at least that's the first time I ever remember seeing it. Uh, but yeah, so parentheses means A is not included in this in this set. Uh, the bracket means it is. So here, 
Um, we are cutting the daily ridership. We are going from the minimum to 10,000 to 20,000 to the maximum. And the labels are going to be called low, medium, and high. We want to include the lowest. So, for example, if we said this to be false, this is a very bad thing the way we constructed it because the daily ridership, we take the minimum. So, for that record, that is the minimum, the minimum ridership. If we didn't say included lowest equals true, that's going to be set to missing. Not a good thing. Um, also, we don't have to say by default right equals true, right? We already know that. So the fact, the element or the specific row that has the maximum ridership, that's already going to be included in the highest category. So now uh, that's one way we can do cutting a variable into different um, breaks. You can combine this with quantile if you're a real big fan of making deciles. Right. That's one way you could do it. So the breaks you would actually give are the quantiles of the distribution. If you want to do quartiles, or you do the probability from 0 to 1 by 0.1 to get deciles. So cut's a really powerful function, really useful. Um, and again, you can give the labels explicitly. Here, it'll again, return it into a uh, factor. And then we can just do a table um, to show that it gives you the exact same result using that if statement or this. So we want, just want to show you the... Uh, uh, the notation, so we just did 1 to 100, uh, and we just hit cut, and th those are the breaks. Um, again, parentheses, uh, the parentheses means 0 is not included, 10 is included, so here we see the levels of that data. And then uh, if we table them, we say obviously 10 cases are within 0 to 10, 15 are from there, and so on and so forth. So that's the notation you would get by default if you don't explicitly set the labels. You say labels equals false. It'll just give you ones, twos, threes, fours. So if you again, if you're really into deciles, if you pass in the the uh, the deciles of the data, uh, it will cut the data the way you want it to without the labels on there. Um, now again, just like all the other factors, if you don't cover the entire data set, you're going to be set to miss. So again, if you say the breaks are 10, 25, 50. It is not, you have to explicitly put the min in there if you want to say the minimum to this value and then that value to the next value, value to the next value. So, for example, data is 1 through 9, right, are not going to be included in here, and data anything above 50 is not going to be included in here the way these breaks are defined, and they are set to NA, right? So, in here we see 1, 15, 225, there's 60 missing values. That is uh, values from 1 to 10. And then 51 through 100. Again, because include.lowest by default equals false. So the lowest break is not included. So the number 10 in this in this uh, vector x is not included, it is now set to NA when you make a newer factor with those breaks. Whew. All right. Lab part two. I think it's relatively straightforward and uh, it's one question, I think. <coughs> All right. Um, actually, lab part two uh, seems to be just more factoring. Sorry, I thought we had a cut example in there. We might have that later. So, um, although I, again, would like to give you a break and don't want to keep talking, uh, I think we're going to breeze through dates really quickly until just this three slides of dates. All right, so who's worked with dates before? Who has a, who's had a pleasant experience with dates? Okay. So I have, I have a story of uh, uh, we had a database, and I said, you know, uh, we got some data from clinicians, and they, they were writing dates in, you know, one slash whatever slash whatever, or like one dash whatever dash whatever, or like Jan slash five. And I was like, I said to our, data, uh, our database person, I said, we need, we need them to get like a calendar on there. Well, the clinicians really like being able to type that in. And I said, I don't care. Um, that's, that's great for them. And then we started to become an international study. And so uh, one patient got enrolled in around, around like mid May or something like that in June. And so I said, This argument, I was like, I will settle this right now. I was like, If, if without any other context from this patient, um, if you can tell me if this visit is May 5th, or sorry, May 6th or June 5th. Like I will, I will stop arguing with you. And he's like, I don't. And he said something, and, he, and I said, Are you guessing? 
And he said, yes. And I was like, the, the conversation is over. You need to put dates in there because, again, European and American uh, you know, standards for putting in dates are like totally different. Now, to alleviate, so alleviate a whole bunch of stress from dates, the Louvre date function does so much work for you. That is not to say that it's going to solve all your problems. If you have some people putting the month first and the day second, or the month first and then other people putting the month second, you're not going to be able to solve that problem with Louvre date. But you will be able to solve problems like this, where you have 1-1 slash 2016, 1 slash 1 slash 2014. It will solve those problems without you having to say like slashes and dashes and all that kind of stuff. You can have somebody saying 1 slash 5 slash 2019, Jan slash 5 slash 2019. It will, it will understand how to parse all those things dynamically and in a smart way and give you reports to say like which ones I, for, I did, wasn't able to parse. So we're going to read the circulator data again. Again, if we look at the head of the data, we didn't necessarily call them dates. We see quotes around them. Um, that doesn't 100% of the time mean it's a character. Dates also have quotes around them, but they're in a very specific order. Library Lubridate. This is the function that, this is the package that we're going to use. It makes dates easier. It is not part of Tidyverse. You have to load it explicitly. Okay. Now, the <laughs> functions of Lubridate are um, MDY, DMY, YMD, all in all combinations, right? But you have to be explicit as to which order it is. So we know, or at least I know from this data, it is month, it is day, it is year. Doesn't matter if it's four-digit year, two-digit year, doesn't care. Month, day, year. So every single one of those combinations, there is a function. YMD, DMI, you know, all those things. This one we're saying create, uh, replace, or create a new variable called new date two. Taking the date variable from the circulator data, and it is in the month, day, year format. Now, if we look at the head of that data here, hey, that looks like a character. Technically, it is not. It is a date object. It is a date type. Dates always are... Uh, shown in the year, month, day format, um, and uh, they're by dashes, right? You can put the run class on this and it'll show you range, min, max, all those lovely numeric operators that you think should work on dates do, right? The range of the data is from 2010, January 11th to 2013, March 1st. So it doesn't, I have to tell it this, month, day, year. Yep. It doesn't guess it from looking to the doesn't guess, it, right? I've never, I've never seen any software that can guess it correctly all the time. But this, at least with that specific ordering, will do the parsing of the hard things. If somebody or, writes like, for example, January fifth, twenty nineteen. Totally fine. And another person writes one nineteen twenty nineteen. It will fix it. Yep. Um, so that's going to be in the lab. So uh, there are also, if, you, if you're like, well, I want times, there are other, other things. So it's YMD, the first three letters, and then if you have hours, minutes, seconds, you do underscore. YMD underscore HMS is year, month, day, hour, minute, second, right? So especially if you have some data here. So for example, 2014, 2, 4, and 2016, 9, 24, at different days and times, Nope, this has two, this is one digit, this is two digits, it's in different orders, it's got slashes, it says YMD HMS, you get two uh, parse dates, you can also specify the time zone if you would like in this function, but the fact that it takes those things and converts to this thing is almost like black magic to me. Yes? So, back to that question, which is, and maybe there's some other way to do it, but if it was mixed in that what the person meant is the first one was actually, uh, what's it called, April 2nd? Uh-huh. Still reading it as February. It was still reading as February. It doesn't matter. Like yes. So in terms of if the input yeah. was mixed between Correct. day, month, and month, year, then... If, if it's not consistent throughout the entire record, it's not going to work right. First thing you do when that happens, you go to whoever collected that data, and then you just, just destroy their computer because they made your life very, very problematic. Right. And almost impossible to parse out. But if everybody is why it's year, month, day, everybody is year, day, month, it's fine. Having things that are conditionally different, like for each row, is a it's a very hard problem. And that's something you were kind of on your own with. 
you have to be like, but you can subset and filter the rows that are like it's this type, and then you parse the dates, and the other one it's this type and parse the dates, and then join them back together. You can do that, but being able to that, like understand which ones are which format, that's a whole thing of data management problem. Right. So again, also this has hour, minute, second. If you parse it with the wrong type of format, you say it's year, month, day, and it's hour, minute, and, and well, well, that has second. So it says, you know what? It gives you a warning. This is how many failed to parse. Uh, that usually means you put the wrong format in there. Now, also, uh, if you guess, if you were guessing and you guessed wrong, so one way to find that out is usually uh, when you have day, when you have months that are over twelve. It says like, hey, that's probably not the way you do it, right? It, it, it fails to parse. It lets you know about that. That's probably one of the only ways. Um, and again, if you say class of that, it's not going to say specifically date. If it is just days, not hours, minutes, seconds, anything like that, it will almost always say class is a date. When you have hours, minutes, and seconds, it's going to say this other format, POSIX CT. Right? So just know that that has dates with times. Um, so there's a function sys.time in R, and uh, you say the time, and uh, when we ran this, it was January 4, 2019 at 4.11 p.m. and 9 seconds Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so if you say the class, it's POSIX CT. Uh, there is a function called as.period where you can add to time. So the time plus 20 minutes in the future. You can give it the unit. So this takes this, adds 20 minutes. That's what it is. This is super helpful, especially when you're making data for like visits. So I'm going to say this is like three months down the line. This is a month down the line. This is when that person should come in. This is their 30-day window. This is their five-day window. As that period is really helpful for that. All right. Let's go to the lab. Lab should be super quick. But the fact that it's quick should not make it any less shocking that this thing can parse dates. I will tell you, I mean, ask anyone who does data analysis for a living, dates are hard. Just 
All righty. So what would I write for the first one? What, what, what function am I using? Year, month, day. Year, month, day. All right. And again, I'm sure it's in quotes. It takes in a character. Totally fine. Now, you can technically do it with already a date object, but don't do that. All right? Once it's already a date, don't mess with it anymore. All right, this one. What do you think this is? It's what? MDY. MDY. Yeah. Technically, I guess this could have been 2004 or 2022, uh, but we're going to go with assuming this is 2014. What's UTC? UTC is uh, universal like time code. So you want to say like... TZ is so EST, oh. Eastern Standard Time, and then there's e, e, uh, oh, doesn't like that. Green Mountain Time, whatever you feel like putting in there. So that it that can cause huge problems with differences in days if you parse with a different time zone. Uh, you can just always be explicit and say like I want UTC, um, so that when you parse two dates. Uh, but like if you're working with data with different time zones, this is like that's a whole another thing on, on its own um, to make sure that you're in the right, you're actually taking the difference in times like the right way. All right, this one, what do we got? We're assuming it's MDY. So I'm gonna say MDY. Just gotta put that second on there. So if we don't, what's it gonna do? It's, it's not gonna parse correctly. Now, all right, run. Yes. Yes, you it isn't. Yeah. Um, but in the time portion, we have our minute. But how does it know that it's. How is it supposed to assume it's 0? So, it, it, yeah. I mean, if, if it's 2, 0, and you don't, you have it as 2, it's going to assume it's 2. Right. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's going to assume it's 2. I don't know if you can have it like so like the plus I mean you can try this so there's like uh dates. This is another trick. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. And I think it's sh uh yeah. So let's What PM? It's, it puts it in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's, if you work with dates before, like, like, it's amazing. So, other great functions. Day. Just do question mark day and pull up the help file on your computer. So, there's day, there's M day, W day, Q day, Y day, and then the way to assign these things. Let's try, so let's just call this one X. This one at the bottom. The one you ran. And let's run day on it. Fifth day of the week. Let's run M day on it. Let's try W day. Again, what is I think I have to put it in, I have to tell it like label equals true. W day label equals true. It's a Tuesday. Let's just say abbreviation equals false. I want it to actually say Tuesday. So W day. Kind of want to know 
So day will tell you it's the fifth, right? Fifth of the month. M day tell you, right? What's M day again? I thought it was the. I always have to look. Um, oh, M day and day are the exact same thing. W day is the day of the week. Hour, minute. So again, remember it's not min, it's already a function min, it's the minimum, right? So it's minute, second, right? Hour, minute, second, whatever you want to parse out of it, right? Um, yeah, what else would you want to grab? I don't know. Like, okay. So I jumped ahead in the slides, uh, sorry about that, but there is another function that's really, 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 really important. It's called diff time. Most of the time, you know, sometimes you care about dates. More often than not, you care about the difference in dates, right? The difference in time. So we are saying diff time. So there are two functions that put uh, uh, two arguments in there: time one and time two. It is not time two minus time one, as you would, as the way I would normally think. It is time one minus time two. So what I did was I said group by day. So I'm going to perform an operation by the specific day, right, which I calculated to be like um, Mondays, to, uh, I think it's Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, that's what I did. So first date, again, this is the dplyr function. First, it's gonna grab the very first date, very first Monday, very first Tuesday, very first Thursday, all on, all, all, uh, so on and so forth. Diff from first and creating a new, new variable called, uh, which is the diff time from the new date. Again, this is a parse date, this is not characters. Time two is the first date. Again, remember, it's time one minus time two. So what it says is like take every single day and subtract it from the first date of that is found. So, for example, this means this is the first Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I think that's, I think it started on a Monday. Not 100% sure, but I have to look at the data. But the idea is this is differences, right? So here, by default, diff time gives you differences in seconds. Let's look at the help file for diff time. So it says automatic, which means it will try seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. Okay? Doesn't do months. Months are a little trickier. Um, so there's also a function called units, where it's like, you know what? I don't want that. So you can either... In diff time, explicitly say the units that you want them to be. You can set days up here. It's also a function called units, where we can actually set the units to be days. So this is the time difference in days. Then you can turn that to numeric and totally run with it however you want. Yes? Wait, so I just want to go back to time one minus time two. It's earlier minus later the way that it's written. So it is whatever the time one is minus the time two. So time two in this, se in this setting, time two is actually early. Okay. So because the, the differences are positive. Okay. If it was time if it was not, they would be negative. Right. So you can write just time one equals, for example, the name of the column and time two equals the name of the column. Yep, exactly. So yes. But you have to know that like it's time one minus time two. Right? Which is the kind of unintuitive kind of way it's it's done for the most part. Um all right, really, really briefly, we're gonna go. Into, so we've talked about data frames, uh, tibbles, that kind of stuff, right? They are kind of general, like holders of things. We've talked about vectors. Vectors can only hold one type. Data frames can have common numerics, common characters, all that kind of stuff. So matrices, matrices are the two-dimensional extensions of vectors, which means it has rows and columns. And it can only contain one type. Like a matrix can only contain numbers or characters or logicals, right? And again, coercion will happen if you have like a matrix that has all numbers in it and you add a column of characters, it'll turn that whole thing into characters. So the matrix function is one way you can actually create a matrix. So n is just a sequence from 1 to 9. Mat is equal to the matrix where we put in that vector and we say the number of rows is 3 and then it adds in the data column-wise, okay? So map is a matrix. No, this looks very different than a tibble and a data frame. If you see anything like this, this is because it is a matrix. 
And again, we talked about brackets notation, bracket subsetting a bit. So it's saying like, if you were to try to extract this, you would just do comma one, and it'll grab column one if you run this bracket notation on mat. Again, matrices are not going to be that useful in your day to day when you're starting out, but sometimes some function might return it. Also, uh, like all the other things, as that character, as that logical, all that kind of stuff, there's an as dot matrix. That matrix stats package I talked about, it's very, very stringent on the thing you pass in as a matrix. So you're saying, like, I have a data set, everything's numeric, I can't use matrix stats on it. You say as dot matrix, turns into no matrix for you. But again, you can only contain one type. So you have any column in there that's characters, the whole thing's getting turned into a character. So data selection, um, essentially matrices have two slots that you can select data. Uh, it always, R almost always goes rows first, columns next. Row, comma, column. Row, comma, column, over and over again. So uh, you can't use dplyr functions on matrices. You have to turn into a data frame or a tibble. Period. Right? So if I say mat, one, comma, one, I want to say grab the first row, grab the first column, that number's one. Mat, one, comma, nothing, says grab the first row, everything in that row. If you don't put anything there, it says everything. Similarly, mat, comma, one, with bracket notation, says grab the first column, grab every single row. So uh, now, when it returns that, right, you grab a column of a tibble, it's like, hey, like, I'm still a tibble. All right, you still do dplyr, all that fun stuff. Matrices don't work that way. You grab one thing, one row, it's now a vector. Technically, in this one, it's an integer. You grab one column, it's a vector. If you grab more than one row, more column, it still returns a matrix. Uh, again, we've already talked about those a bunch, um, the tibbles and data frames. So again, lists are this kind of general tool, uh, this general container of things. So the way you can construct it is list. You won't have to do that on your day-to-day -day for mostly anything. But here's an example. You say letters equal to A, B, and C. Numbers equals one to three, matrix, and then a matrix. So this is a named list where the names are letters, numbers, and then nothing. So the first element in the list is a character vector. The second element of the list is a numeric vector. The third element of the list is a matrix. So if you have names, like a data frame, you can use the dollar sign to grab them. So letters and numbers, you can grab that by my list, dollar sign, letters, my list, dollar sign, numbers. Otherwise, you have to use a different kind of uh, subsetting. If you print it, this is how it looks like. So you see dollar sign letters, dollar sign numbers, then you see this weird double bracket notation. This is specifically for lists. So um, if you say my list, bracket one, single bracket, it always returns a list. Right? Single brackets and lists always return a list. Even if you say my list bracket letters, even if it's named, returns a list. Double brackets return the actual element. It, it's saying like extract the first. So this is like grab the first thing from the list and actually keep it as a list. This says grab the first thing in the list, but actually what's inside it. Right? Um, and if it's named, you can use dollar signs. And if it's named, you can use double brackets with the names. So again, letters just has that three-dimensional thing. And you can subset multiple things uh, using kind of, you know, you said the sequence from one to two. It will return a list of the first and second elements of that list. But again, it will return it as a list. Um, I'm going to go through. All right. So totally went through lists very fast because, again, majority of the time, one specific time in this class and your day-to-day -day operation starting out it's going to be potentially if you split strings up there are also tidy versions of that um, for the for like over 50 percent of your cases when you want to split a column into three columns based on space it already we already have functions for that in a tiny way and sometimes you know data doesn't like to ascribe to the rules you want to give right data comes in in all shapes and sizes and all weird things and character vectors. And sometimes you need a larger set of toolboxes. And sometimes when you're splitting data up, splitting strings up, it will return a list and you need something more powerful than what we're going to describe with separate and unite, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But at the end of the day, lists exist. They are very different than the rest of the data. Double bracket notation exists. And if you're extracting something and you keep getting a list back, that's probably because you're not using double brackets. That is kind of the take home messages of lists. 
Also, matrices exist. They have rows and columns like tibbles and data frames. They are less useful to use starting out because they don't work with deep fire, but sometimes, again, something might return it. But you can always say as tibble to get it back into that format. There's not there's a big difference between matrices and everything else, like tibbles and data frames, all that kind of stuff. The big difference is matrices can only have one type, just like vectors. Only all numbers, only all characters, only all um, logicals. All right. So, tomorrow, Andrew's going to take you to the large foray into data cleaning. So, uh, I will say this. Data cleaning is one of the hardest things to teach. Because it is uh, an art and, like, a, I forget, what is it? Uh, every happy family is happy in the same way. Every dysfunctional family is dysfunctional in its own way. It's the same thing with data. Every clean data set's clean in its own way. Every dirty data is dirty in its own way. Right? So, um, giving you kind of a, 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 a toolbox for that is very hard. For the most part, we're going to talk about missing data. We're going to talk about strings and characters. Because that's a lot of the cleaning you're doing. Right? There's nothing much we can do if someone puts value, like you can divide something by 100 if somebody puts in 100 instead of 10, that kind of stuff. But if you have free text or something that you need to convert into numbers and people just put kind of whatever they want there, that's a lot of string cleaning. So we'll really focus on that. All right, so now, for the most part, uh, you can do a lot of the operations you want to with a, with a data set. We haven't gone into the, to merging yet, but we will tomorrow. But for the most part, subsetting rows, subsetting columns, uh, doing some quick plots of exploratory data analysis, being able to group and summarize, summarize data, being able to add columns, being able to get summary statistics. That is the majority of the job for the most part, right? Getting that data into like a tabular format and writing it out into some other format, right for score CSV, that is pretty much where we're at in this class so far. So the big things coming up are what do you do with strings? How do you plot data like some really complex plots, right? Um, how do you do statistical tests? Right? Those are the big three three things we're gonna cover. Right? Um, oh, so just to end the class with something interesting, fun. As if you weren't just like interested in just having a blast the whole time here so far. We talked about Plotly. You asked about that. So there's a package called Plotly, which I said does interactive graphics. So remember, I said like, uh, I don't feel like going through this. I had the I had the code all up and I forgot to. So right now, if we learn teach you ggplot2, the most important function that you need to know. In Plotly is ggplotly. So what will that do? So here, qplot, we say length, we're saying uh, factor type. So let me read in the bike data set again because we did all that manipulation with bike. Read bike. And run this again. So again, qplot, y is the length, x is the type, the data is the bike data set, geom box plot. We've talked about this today and we talked about how to flip coordinates, right? That should be nothing new to anyone here. The new thing is we encapsulated that. So again, the crazy thing about ggplot, which we'll talk about way more detail in visualization, is you can save that as an object. That plot is an object, right? And so if you use the ggplotly function, what does that do? It's like, ah, yeah, you gave me a box plot. Cool. Like nothing's changed. Now, the big difference is this. Interactive graphics... Zooming in on certain areas, I can zoom back out, I can pan, I can upload this to a website. <clears throat> if you're using our markdown, you embed this, it's an interactive graphic in the HTML. You send that HTML to your collaborator, they have an interactive graphic that they can open up as long as they can open up a web page. Right? You can reset things. The actual minimum values are embedded in there so you can actually see it. This is crazy important. Um, and useful for a lot of instances if you're doing exploratory data and you're going to like a collaborator or boss or whatever and you're saying, like, look, look at this data. And almost every single time I've ever done that with a collaborator, they're like, who's that person? Why is that person all the way out there? What is going on there? It is, 
Like, and you just like click it, and they're like, that's patient 64. And they're like, okay. Like, they're like, okay. Like, that's patient 64. Like, you don't have to go back to your computer. Like, who's that? Like, what is that value? Right? The ability to, to do that in Plotly is, 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 cannot be kind of undervalued. And the nice thing about it, the nice thing about teaching ggplot2, it's not going to give you all the functionality of the interactivity that you want, but it will give you, get you a lot of the way there. You just learned the ggplot way. You're like, now I have to learn something new. ggplotly kind of says, you already got a ggplot? Make it into an interactive graph. It works in the Jupyter Notebooks, I believe, as well. But it, sh it should, yeah. Because... So Plotly is a JavaScript library as long as you, because uh, the library should be embedded, the JavaScript header should be embedded into the uh, Jupyter Notebook, so it should be fine. All right, so like zooming in, zooming out, it has other auto scaling, reset everything. I don't know what that does. Show the closest data point on hover, like compare data. Oh, like, uh, yeah. So can do um, some really nice things. Uh, there's a whole book. On Plotly, so the right, the author, so and it's all online with all code examples of how to use it. Um, so any any Plotly plot you make, oop, any Plotly plot you make, there's a button up here. Come on, there's a button up here. I think to collaborate. If you click, oh yeah, click collaborate. It'll bring you to the book. And lastly, where is this go away? So there's a button we haven't talked about, and we're not going to really talk about in detail. But there's a button called Publish Document. All right, don't do this, and you can't be releasing the data, but you're doing it for like something. You're like, I want to make this into a website that I upload to some to this, this place, and I can show somebody else what it is. That's fine. If you're working with like PHI or data that's not supposed to go anywhere else. Don't don't do this. But the idea is this can push up to a uh, a server. All right. So you're going to come back with a whole bunch of set of tools and fun bells and whistles um, when you go back. All right. If you have any questions, email us. Um, I Yeah, so again, just kind of use use, a, kind of use your head if like, you run into stuff in the homework where it like, doesn't necessarily make any sense. That, like, we haven't learned any of that stuff yet. Like, it's asking for certain things. You just skip over that and just kind of, sorry, maybe just wait until the next lecture. It's like, Talking about string manipulation, things like that. We haven't gotten to that, so just wait until we kind of go on that. Or try on your own. But I would suggest, like, you know, if you're doing the homework, if it doesn't seem like we cover it, we probably have it. All right? And this one will actually have audio.